I will be presenting on Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, and this is by Delaney, Allie Daly, Rachel Nowak, and Delaney Partridge. So some background on the case. So way before in 1896, the case Plessy v. Ferguson was taken to the Supreme Court, and it was ruled that separate but equal was um, constitutional um, in schooling and in all cases of segregation. However, in 1953, lawyer Thurgood Marshall combined evidence from multiple, multiple different discriminatory cases in uh, school districts around the country into that of Linda Brown, seen here, um, a student in Topeka, Kansas. And her case was that she lived a lot closer to a white school that she could walk to school in, but instead she was forced to take a bus and walk uh, multiple miles every day to her um, black school. And in this specific school district, it's interesting because schools for white students were of the same caliber as schools for students of color, which was really important to the case because it made um, everyone focus on the reality and like the implications of separating children and not the difference in the education levels. So the constitutional issue that was being discussed here was the violation of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment has an equal protection clause saying that every person shall be protected equally under the law. In the case of Linda, they thought that um, they, people were not being equally protected. And within the hearing, uh, the middle of the hearing of the case, Justice Earl Warren was appointed as the new Chief Justice after Chief Justice Vincent passed away. And this was really crucial in their decision because Warren knew that for the Supreme Court's decision to appear legitimate and be taken seriously in Southern states, there had to be a unanimous ruling on the case. So he rewrote their um, decision multiple times until they all unanimously agreed. And the parties in involved were Oliver Brown, the father of Linda Brown, and 12 other plaintiffs, as said, those combined cases from across the country and Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. And here is a map of before Brown v. Board was ruled on, um, the state of whether or not you could segregate uh, schools. And here we go again, the summary of the argument. So in the case of Linda Brown, um, the separation of children in school based solely on their race violates the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment. And that segregation by law tended to make black students feel inferior to white students. There were multiple studies done by Kenneth Clark and other sociological doctors at the time um, stating that it had detrimental effects to their mental health and their self-esteem. And then the Board of Education's argument was that the schools uh, provided for students of color were the same quality as those provided for white students. So there wasn't a difference in education and that they were in compliance with the standards given from Plessy versus Ferguson. Okay, so the Supreme Court decision. In the end, the justices of the Supreme Court unanimous, unanimously voted to deseg desegregate public schools, ultimately cutting the previously legalized separate but equal policy, giving legal permission of racial, of racial segregation as long as services and such were equal in the 1896 Plessy v. Ferguson case. The reasoning behind this decision was so as they now saw racial segregation among children in schools unconstitutional with the separate but equal policies far from equal shown through the evidence and arguments in the case. But was this the right decision? Oops. Yes, there was a major lack of value held to the D degradation of African Americans shown by the obliviousness of the extent of this separate but equal policy was held accountable for, along with the continuity of this obliviousness for the large time gap being. Giving a higher significance to the absence of care for African Americans as a low priority in the perspective of the United States government, reflecting almost hypocrisy of the Constitution, going the opposite direction to make little progression towards our original dreams of America, such as all men are created equal. The decision allowed for further development in the freedoms and rights in the United States to be held up to the extent that they are said to be in the Constitution, ultimately inching closer what the most neutral see as a better America to ensure and provide reliable individual value and justice, working for the greater good and trueness of the values of America is based upon, now can be used as a teaching a lesson to learn, grow, and improve the greater unity. So for short-term impact, directly after the um, Supreme Court made their decision, news articles about the decision skyrocketed and the publicity was very notable. Um, active resistance in the South against the ruling of the case occurred 
and many white Southerners viewed the ruling against segregation as a threat to their um, quote unquote superiority beliefs. And the victory was significant in the short term to the NAACP because they had lawyers that represented Brown in the case at the Supreme Court. So it was a big win for them and they had been working towards it for a long time. A result of this verdict was the planning for the argument for the second verdict that would decide the role the court would play in actively ending segregation. So Brown v. Board was actually split up into two decisions. The first one was deciding whether or not separate but equal was constitutional. So they decided that was unconstitutional and the second ruling was about what role the court would play. And Thurgood Marshall, who was an attorney for the NAACP understood that the first decision was only partial and it was only part of the um, success of Brown v. Board. And he knew that its short-term impacts had to be defended and protected with the second verdict and began preparing for it right away. The second verdict of the case dealt with the role the Supreme Court should have in ending racial segregations in schools. And both sides, Brown and Board of Education, argue for respectively. Um, Brown argued for prompt desegregation and, and the um, Board of Education argued for why desegregation shouldn't occur. And the court ruled in 1955, just a year after the initial Brown v. Board verdict, that education should be integrated and school districts can do it in their own way by their own timeline with quote unquote deliberate speed. So this ruling was kind of a compromise between both sides and many of the Southern states took the um, thing about the timeline and deliberate speed as they could do it as slow as they wanted to. So that kind of caused some problems with future cases and problems with segregation in the South. Throughout the civil rights movement, desegregation expanded past schools to restaurants, jobs, public services, and more. Um, Brown v. Education is often considered a catalyst or a spark for the boycotts that happened after it. Um, against racial, racist laws all over the country, and it increased the fight around segregation all over the country in legal battles, protests, and more, and ultimately led to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And it was a really big landmark case um, in one, because of all those other reasons, two, because it reversed the decision of Plessy v. Ferguson, which ruled that separate was equal, and it was symbolic in that it proved the Constitution was sided with racial equality. For more long-term impact, um, discrimination and segregation in America still exist, and there have been many cases of voter discrimination, school admission discrimination, and in more recent history, there have been um, other cases like this. The fight is still ongoing, and in light of recent periods like Black Lives Matter, arguments surrounding systematic racism and discrimination are still continuing and fighting for equality. And that's it.